Good evening, everyone. This is such a beautiful space. So nice. Can you hear me okay? Okay. All right, a few poems. I always write about earth, so here are some earth poems. This is just a little warm up. This one's called Honor. Honor. Honor who you are. You are an honorable animal of this planet. Your soul delectable, ancient, and sweet like honey made of the life elixir. Precious, unique. It's just a little mouth warm up, ear warm up. This one's called The Sweet Sister. The Sweet Sister. May we open to the luminous constant of life, the sea of stars in the soaring night, the dawn and the dusk who opens wide, and the child who speaks with all truth in their eyes. Cherish the wee buds that bloom on the trees and respect their rights their sovereignties. May we remember the strength of our ancestors' powers. Know that we know what they knew in now's hours. Listen, listen from the mountain tops of mind. Speak from the deep river flowing inside. For this is why we came at all to this land of soil and toil, for the reality of the sweet sister singing in us all. So whether you think you're brave or you think you're small, the sweet sister sings, brings sanctity to those who call. But don't miss her entry Mistake it for something small, like your belly softening or your grieving waters fall. She lives here in your earthy sinews and your body calls, and she waits for you to surrender, to finally stand soft and to stand tall. Time. One more? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. This one um, is called Call to Mama's People. Last one. Uh, yeah, it's kind of just about the context we're living in and the, the, the great possibility and the great change time we're in. And you may be able to hear me, you may not. Let's see. Call to mama's people. Nothing is absolute. Nothing's ever been for certain. Not the storm that's coming closer, <laughs> nor the seed just planted. Tangential forces spin, delight or despair, and one can never tell for sure what will root from a romp in the dirt. These the daily salutations of the good reality of earth. And when we're called, and when we're called to wade through the rising waters, tears streaming down our faces, mouths full of prayers to the just and creative ancestors, we must move forward with the knowing. Nobody is coming to heal our disrupted systems for us. The work is in our hands and the arc of change defined by the depth we can root our hunger in our bodies and grow new actions. To be alive today is to know that change is our nature. Thank you.
Can you hear me over the rain? I have two poems to read tonight. I think they'll be slightly under five minutes, so I'm not going to introduce them with much, except to say that both were somewhat inspired by an old friend of mine who sent me some very long letters. One was two years ago, and uh, one was just the other day, and I had uh, the thoughts of that recent long letter in my brain when I went to Donna Perry's uh, workshop at King's College when I wrote the second poem. So the first one is called Embers. The first part of it, by the way, are lines from a poem by Louise Gluck. This form is called the Glossa, and you borrow four lines from another poet. Embers. You die when your spirit dies, otherwise you live. You may not do a good job of it, but you go on. Something you have no choice about. This from Averno by Louise Gluck. After reading the long, long, long letter of a friend, so full of death, suffering, tragedy, and horror, I set those 11 pages down to reflect upon the fact that my mother may be dead. My imagination tries to turn away from her tumbled body at the bottom of some stairs and no one there to hear her cries. You die when your spirit dies. So I call and there hasn't been a fall or much to worry about. A doctor's appointment next week, the inevitable discovery that the body declines. The medical profession will pronounce you less than perfect to give you apprehensions about the state of your existence, credence and valid cause to whine, your message like water through a sieve. Otherwise, you live. After a while on the phone, you are not cutting it short, as you often do. I have called at a good time for you, but the logs in my fireplace are burning low, and I am feeling chill not feeling the perfect sun, I suggest we cut it short. You have one more story to tell. The embers will, will still glow on. You may not do a good job of it, but you go on. What you say to save our connection is lost on me today. I remember only the person I was on the phone yesterday. You wanted to go on about ailments, illness, and offenses me with so little to shout except the embers in the fireplace are almost out. Might that be the theme of all your recent words to me? You speak of life in a voice of doubt, something you have no choice about. So more recently, following a second long, long, long letter, I wrote this poem called Estrangement. My old friend sent another letter again, long, 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 eight type pages. He talks about the estrangement of his father, how he supports his dad now in his time of dementia. He talks about the estrangements of aunts and uncles too, who now come to visit demented dad, but spend time reminiscing, talking to my old friend. He mentions repeatedly his estrangement from his sister, but I think back to the fact that they used to have pictures taken with Santa Claus in the mall before Christmas. Every year, for year after year after year, they were not estranged, they were the kids. She and he on Santa's knee, who has the pictures now? Maybe they both have their copies. Maybe they will reconcile after a long, long, long while. Reconcile. Thank you very much. The professor gives a lecture on Dadaism. She is articulate, her hair is neatly tied behind her skull, and that morning she fixed herself two eggs, three strips of chicken bacon, and a halved grapefruit. 
and they say schooling is all that. Um, if it doesn't come running like a pack of hyenas from your wrists, don't do it. If it doesn't march like a foreign army valiant in a strange public square, don't do it. If you wouldn't be driven to madness, suicide, rampage, or self-mutilation, don't do it. If you want lovers in your bed or locks of your hair auctioned, don't do it. If you were dragged, beaten, and bloodied to the pulp of a helpless animal and still you reached for a quill, for a page, perhaps there is something there. I've spoken with professors who quib over the fins of sharks, the lice of lions. I've met with devotees and subordinates and unoriginal chanters by the myriad. I ask them why. Why? To be learned? With your nickels in a row? All right, this is about a club in London called Gatsby, and the um, people who I saw there. Sharing their wounds in the glow of gas lamps of ecstasy or drink or cocaine, breathing tepid cigarette steam in the communal stew of a common calamity and want of purpose, binding their bodies throbbingly in the midnight heat indoors of crumbling and scattered want of love bludgeoning the language and absenting eye contact in lost and swollen adjacent circumspection, writhing uncontrollably in the mongrel air, snapped into frenzies like frozen reeds, storm shattered and scattering disintegration to the gods of bastardized lore, contemplating little less than the cigarette burning down while wide-eyed watching the pretties wiggle indoors for something worthy of their sweet attention. Troubled by being troubled, sore of soreness, wishing to have touch a, touched a place too far sheltered in their chests with ribs compla of complacent, martyred sentimentality, manifesting formulaic odes to the disintegration of originality, offering nullified phrases bereft of conviction like scripture to each other, the common cockerel shoving his way through as the girls pout their freshly ripened sexuality on elevated planes, beneath the warier schizophrenic club lights. Grinding down teeth and protruding bottom jaws high and battered of brain, bolstering anonymity. Meandering around the concave hearts of insubstantial amateur drunks until the DJ stopped impossibly. The house lights leaping into the iron reality structure of lights and insulation above as a dawn breaks a fog. Gradually and without remorse or reason and the ardent remaining stunting borrowed lyricism. Harkening addresses and phone numbers to jumbled messes of desperation, depravity jumping into ears and palms, leaping into taxis and strange beds to curb the tragedy of the inevitable return. Thanks. I'm the video guy. <laughs> My friend Andrew put a, a challenge to me last time we were here to read something tonight. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to write something, uh, but I did find something that I wanted to read. Uh, a high school that we went to in Woodstock, um, it's right across the street from the Woodstock Public Library. And I used to skip school and spend that time in the library, which is weird to me. Uh, but that's what I used to do, because it was right there and it was convenient. So I used to you know, look through the stacks and I found this book one day that was a collection of anonymous poems. And I don't have a long, I don't have a thorough knowledge of poetry, but this is a book that I've visited again and again, and I really like the stuff in there. And there's something about the idea of a poem being anonymous, that there's no pretentious asshole on the back of the book posing for his picture. There's, there's no story connected to it at all. It's just a poem that somebody found and somebody had the, the courage to publish, and it's here in the book. So I'm gonna read one of the, one of the poems that I really like from that book. It's called, and check this for a title, Sonnet Found in a Deserted Madhouse. Oh, that my soul a marrow bone might seize, for the old egg of my desire is broken. Spilled is the pearly white and spilled the yolk, and as the mild melancholy contents grease my path, the shorn lamb baws like bumblebees. Time's trashy purse is as a taken token or like a thrilling recitation spoken by mournful mouths full of, filled full of mirth and cheese. And yet why should I clasp the earthful urn or find the frittered fig that felt the fast or choose to chase the cheese around the churn or swallow any pill from out the past? Ah, no love, 
not while your hot kisses burn like a potato riding on the blast. I always picture that potato <laughs> riding on the blast. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm not a writer or a poet. I'm the guy that helps Kevin carry in his camera equipment. Um, so, but I came here last month and helped set up, and I really appreciated hearing your words, and it was very beautiful, and it, it was so nice to be a part of it, and I thought it's not really fair if I don't at least come up and try. But I don't know how you do it, I don't know how you find your motivation, so I was going through some books of mine, and, uh, and for whom the bell tolls, Hemingway wrote, nothing is done to oneself that one does not accept, and if you love someone, it would take it all away. And so that kind of got me started, and I just wrote a tiny little poem that I'll try tonight. Your hands are cold, your fingers freezing. But when I walk with you, the warmth of your heart carries me. Let's find ways to laugh, and I'll warm those hands. We're getting addicted to coffee, but that's a small price to pay for those early mornings spent together, lazing on futon couches in the lounge as we listen to pre-recorded fireplace sounds and watch a beautiful silent gas fireplace. Don't look at the clock, don't check your watch. Just warm those cold fingers in my hands and dream of something special. Thank you. I had to ask Kevin the title of this poem that I love by uh, Jack Kerouac. October in the Railroad Earth. And uh, it's one of those poems that tries to bring the whole universe together into a single strip of words and images. And, and uh, it gets me every time I read it. Anyway, this here poem is exactly the opposite to that. It's no attempt to copy that at all. It's called Glimpse. Glimpse. In the morning blue, Coming in with the breeze, sunstrokes dappled on water so bright they nearly blind me, and to one side, ice in the reeds. The last time you threw paint at the already muddied fortress, eagles scattered like nothing but hyenas. I checked it and snubbed the destiny then turned up scorched after hitting the sun. Always look at me like that, with styrofoam winters in your teeth, a firecracker buried in your eye, a snake track on the tile. While I, while I slam down on alphabet salad, be there molding a tableau into shape, be there when I'm wafting the unfolding dimension to bulldoze fire hydrants, propping the outputs up like spinning plates until they shine. Okay, here's one for my boat lily, the other of the two plants. <laughs> a limp tongue on my brain, steaming at the morning light, goodly, the sum of my improvisations. And you might laugh a flicker or a snide blink. Yeah, so subtle. Surfing on teardrops, splish, your swallowing reflex, headlong at pixelated talons, pure points. Eye drum and ear ball marauders, Little gifts of wax, misunderstandings, collated, uncanned me, guided by you to my creased palm like a business card over and over. And I write on the back, pull my feet from my footing, free me rug burn, smile, look away. This is another one for my African violet. <laughs> I'm between oscillation and explosion on what to call this pink phenomenon an iris undone, her graceful fall, a flick so swift, unhinged, and floating. When you crawl downwards, note the braids piled up and the flutter of a tip and a tip ripe and feelers frenzied wanting. I'll sally down my list. Multidimensional handshakes abounding, a close furrow. That's a nod to a parasite. Chores, a strong caress sent to a friend like you. So in a bright time, I'll blow further on a cold, golden breeze. It's the last one, and uh, it's for my boat lily again. 
willing finally, first able, the scores stacked up to prove your perch in torture. Perfect filamental upbringing. Obsidian specter showing spectrum like a hand of hold up. Then the binding, the spiral afterwards for kicks. In a countdown, I promise to hold you. In a lifetime, well, that's relative. And your horses will not shut out the crybaby display till the layover. If you are en route to domination, today's the same. Just don't catch to my angling light in the corner. And that's all I have. Thanks a bunch. Yeah.